Hello and welcome to the strategic analysis of the management case study. So this is the penultimate video in our video series. And in this video, what I'm going to do is take you through some of the key strategic models. So this is the models from E2 and E1 and apply them to the case study. And also what we'll be doing is just generally going through a summary of all the points that we've brought up throughout the pre-scene. So, for starters, you know, just another overview introduction of the cases, the, the perfume industry. Now, it's probably something that we're all very aware of in terms of the use of perfume. We probably have all used perfumes or aftershaves or something like that at one point or other in our lives. But it's probably something that we don't know much about in terms of how that fragrance gets from the design phase to that lovely bottle in the department store when we go in to pick it up. So it's possibly a, quite an interesting business for us to have looked at. So let's take a look. Now, the context, as it were, of how I'm going to assess this company in these strategic analysis is by the rational model. So essentially what this is, is where the company wants to go, how it's going to get there, what's its future vision, its mission, its objectives. And then also where the company is now. So we'll do that by looking at the external environment. And we'll do that by looking at the Pestle analysis and the Porter's Five Forces analysis and also internal analysis. So analyzing the, the company itself and where the company is. And finally, how we're going to get there. So we know where we are. We know where we want to be. How are we going to get there? How are we going to build an effective strategy, effective growth strategy to achieve our objectives? So let's start by looking at where we want to be in the future. And as I mentioned, we'll look at that through the governance and through the stakeholder models. So let's start off with mission statements. Now, what is a mission statement? You, many companies will have mission statements. They're all about just a quote of what the company is, what the company wants to achieve, where the company is going, why does the company exist? Now, if you go into many major organizations, the first thing you'll probably see on the wall, above the reception desk, or wherever in the reception room, there'll be a big highlighted statement, and that is the mission statement. So that whenever an employee walks through the door to the office, they see that big mission statement. So it's, it's driving home the, the objectives of the organization to everyone. And so Campbell set out the, the four components of a good mission statement. So the purpose, for example, is the first one. Why does the organization exist and for who does it exist? So let's take a look at that in relation to scent. Now, why does scent exist? Now, we weren't given a mission statement in the exam, uh, sorry, in the precinct analysis, which to me leads me to believe that there may be some sort of statement regarding this in the actual unseen, you know, that you could be asked to come up with a mission statement because we do not currently have one. So why would SENT have a mission statement? Why would it, uh, what does it exist for? Now it could be that our purpose is to provide the finest quality fragrances to our consumers. So how would we go about providing the finest quality fragrance and that could be through adequate research, it could be through clever marketing to provide that brand experience, all these sorts of things. So sustainability perhaps is a good purpose as well. The purpose is to get people in, well, good marketing to get people into buying our perhaps our fine fragrances, our legacy perfumes early on and to maintain them, keep them as customers throughout their life. So strategy is the next one. So how will the organization compete? How are we going to compete against our major competitors? And this could be by providing the best quality, the professor value for money. This again extends to the values, which is the third part of the mission statement. 
and then policies. Now, policies that people are expected to follow to achieve this value, to achieve this strategy. So that again ties back into the employees walking through the door to the office whenever they start work, seeing that strategy. We are going to provide the best quality products to our consumers at the best price. So really install that in the employee as they're coming in. So everyone is working together. An organization you know, is like a centipede. And all the legs need to be moving in the same direction. And that is what a mission statement is. It is creating an included, almost family atmosphere that everyone is striving towards the same goals. So as I mentioned, we were not really given any specific targets in the pre-scene. So we could, be, we could be asked to come up with one in the exam. And so another way of looking at this is through the balance scorecard. Now, the balance scorecard was once described as almost like a aeroplane cockpit. You know, you have all these different dials, all of them showing different things, and but all of them need to be working well to keep the aeroplane in the sky, to keep it flying, to keep it operating. Now, businesses often, particularly in the past, fell into the trap of thinking that the only thing that really mattered was financial performance. That as long as the company was making money, as long as the shareholders were getting their dividends, the company was getting the right amount of investment, that everything was fine. But that is not the case anymore. There needs to be far more non-financial indicators, non-financial performance measures of measurements to achieve solid growth. And the reason for that is that often solely relying on financial performance can lead to short-termism. It can lead to directors wanting to perhaps sell out the organization a bit more in the short term to achieve financial growth rather than thinking about the long-term sustainability of the company. So let's take a look then at governance. So we mentioned about the risks of directors acting in their own interests rather than in the interests of the business. So this is the way in which organizations are controlled, the way that they're administrated and directed by the directors and need to be ensuring that they are in the right interests of all the shareholders and stakeholders involved. And some of the key parts of good governance are listed here. Now it's worth noting that the UK code of governance is applied internationally, it's not just in the UK, and it is not a legal requirement. It's not a 100% legal thing that if you do not comply with it, that you'll go to prison or something like that. It's not, but you must explain in your public accounts and to your shareholders why you didn't comply with it. And this could be for a very good reason. And if so, then people might be happy with that. But if you do not have a good reason, or even if you do, it may look bad from a public relations perspective. So let's take a look at just a few of the things here. You know, having a separate chairman and CEO. This is because the chairman is head of the board and the CEO is head of the company and the board decide on the directions of the company. So if you have a CEO and a chairman that is the same person, they may devise a strategy for the company that they know is easy for them to fulfill at the actual business operation level. So therefore, they are doing it for themselves to achieve their own targets, setting themselves easy targets they know they'll be able to achieve so that they ben it benefits them rather than benefits the company. Now, independent non-executive directors. This is because we need people who their own salary, their own livelihood is not based purely on the performance of this company. Because the danger with that is with just having executive directors is that, again, they could act in their own interests. Now, another thing that wasn't really mentioned in the case was the general annual general shareholders meetings and the regular meetings with institutional shareholders. Now, this is essential as part of good corporate governance because it is to do with ensuring that the shareholders get the chance to air their views. So if the shareholders have 
issues with something that the company is doing, they have to be able to get their points across because after all, they are the owners of the corporation. So let's take a look at corporate governance in relation to SENT then. Now, as we know, they had four non-executive directors and five executive directors. So this is less than 50% of the directors. Now, the corporate governance codes indicates that ideally a board will be of 12 people comprising of six executive directors and six non-executive directors. However, it's not too bad on that basis because you know, there's still a reasonable amount of non-executive directors. And also, we know that the board are well experienced. They, they, they have experience in the area and they have experience with the company. Many of them have been there for several years. So they will be well ingrained with the culture of the organization. Now, let me move on to the independent non-executive chairman. Now, as we mentioned, it's important to have an independent chairman. However, whilst the chairman here is experienced and acts as the head of the audit and nomination committee, there is questionable independence of him because he was the CEO. So he, again, is coming from a non-independent background. He knows a lot about the inner workings of the organization. There's also a potential conflict of interest here because he also sits on the board of the Zealand Cosmetic Toiletry and Perfume Association. So the issue with that is, is that he sits on the board of the organization of the company that sets the regulations within the industry and as well on the board of a company that works within the industry. So you, know, you, can, you can foresee an instance where he is deliberately fighting against certain regulations at the Cosmetic Toiletry and Perfume Association because he knows they will be difficult to apply at, at scent. And we also know from the, the case study that whilst they have an audit and nomination committees featuring the right amount of people, three people on each, there was no remuneration committee. Now, this is the committee that decides on the payment in effect to the executive directors. Now, it's very important that these facts and figures are made public because it often, it often could be a negative thing if the directors are paid far more than people feel they should be. And if you're not disclosing them, it could be that you don't wish to disclose them for that very issue. And now if you look at particularly during the economic fallout of the banking crisis, people were getting cross because these bankers or the directors of the banking industries were getting paid these huge bonuses despite the fact that the, the banks had failed so badly and they'd cost a lot, of, a lot of money to the public and to the businesses that they considered their clients. So this can be quite an issue. And also here, I've picked out some of the the key points from that list that we saw on the previous slide that there is little evidence of in the case study. So again, disclosures of director's pay. There's no, it doesn't talk about how the information is passed up from senior management level up to the directors. Now, there's no indication of how the directors get the appropriate information required to make these key strategic decisions. And again, no meetings with institutional shareholders or the annual general meeting. But this is very important because the shareholders are the owners of the organization and need to have a good idea of what's going on at the organization. So another thing is corporate social responsibility. Now, admittedly, this is a very new thing. And we know that the uh, Centre was set up in Zealand over 70 years ago. So corporate social responsibility was perhaps not something that was in effect at the time. And so it needs to be, it needed to have been incorporated and included as the, the company grew and progressed into the, the modern age. Now, it's a very important thing and SEMA do like to test it because it's quite closely tied with ethics. Now, there's perhaps no legal requirement for some corporate social responsibility things, but it plays well with the public if you do. And it's something that organizations are expected to, and expected to do because 
organizations are, you know, huge things. They have a substantial impact on the environment and a substantial impact on the world in which they operate in. So it's important that they have a positive impact and not a negative one. So I've listed a few key issues here that can be brought up. Now, environmental issues. Obviously, these are a factory, a manufacturing process is perhaps going to use a lot of energy. So it could, it could perhaps reduce its energy. This could be by installing uh, energy efficient light bulbs in their offices. It could be by installing low flow plumbing facilities in the offices. Or just doing any, anything they can really to reduce their energy consumption. And all this, well, pollution as well. You know, recycling more, using more recycled materials rather than throwing them away to help reduce pollution and reduce waste. Another one I picked out here is staff. Now, companies can often be judged on how they treat their staff. I've used the example before of Primark when it was found out that they were using child labour in third world countries. It had a real negative effect on the public because people don't like to feel that they're buying from a company that, that takes advantage of things that they consider to be wrong and immoral. And the way that you treat your staff can also have a significant impact on the applicants you get because people who value themselves as employees, who value themselves with their, on their skill sets, will not want to be treated poorly. Now, if you look at the pre-scene, we could see that LK, in their assessment of LK, there was a, a significant section on the way they treat their staff and how a lot of stock is given to the internal development and training of staff and also the flexibility of the working hours for, for parents or new parents and things like that. So there was no mention of how we treat our staff that sent in the pre-scene, but you need to know that it is important. And for example, it could come up in the exam. You could be given some information on staffing and staff satisfactory and ways in which we can improve on that. And finally, um, ethics here. Now, the use of natural resources and animal testing. There was a section at the start of the manufacturing process section uh, detailing the the issues of using animals in testing. Now, many people frown upon that, but then of course, the flip side of that is, if you don't test on animals, how do you necessarily know it's safe for humans? Well, people often don't agree with that argument and think that there should be other ways in which it is done, or it should be used with ingredients that we know are going to be okay, such as more natural resources. But the issue of using natural resources is that they're not renewable enough it, it, it takes millions of flowers to provide the amount of oil needed for a batch of per, for, for several batches of perfume. So, you know, is this going to have an impact on the environment? You could argue that growing the flowers is good for the environment. The fact that so many of them are being harvested purely for this purpose is is not ethical because you are perhaps not allowing the flowers to repollinate enough. You're not. You're not using the flowers in the way that they should be. We, it said that they have to be picked as soon as the buds start to show. So you know, this is not contributing to the natural cycle of the flower's life because it is not having a full life as it were. So we move on to critical success factors. So these are the things that the organisation must do well to succeed. This is the things that perhaps they do better than anyone else or the things that they are imperative to their growth. So a good strategy is building upon your critical success factors or ensuring that your critical success factors are maintained at the level that they are.